Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending the paper presentation by Brian Baldy from the University of Massachusetts and Cynthia Mejia from the University of Central Florida in the United States of America. The topic to be presented is utilizing slow reading techniques to promote deep learning across the disciplines. This will be a 20 minute presentation with a 10 minute Q&A at the end of the session. Please place your questions in the questions tab. Please also interact by pressing the like function if you would like the same question put forth to be answered. Lastly, I would appreciate if everyone can mute their mics during the presentation. Brian and Cynthia, you may start whenever you are ready. Great. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're very happy to share our research with people. Um, one thing I'll mention, um, just a technical thing, I'm going to be kind of advancing slides through Google Slides. And to do that, I need to toggle to a different tab. Um, so when I do that, I can't really see the Canopy interface. So I won't see questions. But um, uh, bear with us, and we'll get to them. Um, so I'll start us off. Um, Cynthia, do you want to say, uh, say anything before we get started? Oh, just like to say welcome. Super happy to be here. Uh, Brian and I have been preparing for this for a long time, and it's very exciting. It's finally here. Thanks for coming. Great. So let's get started. Um, <clears throat> so here's our agenda for this session. Uh, it's a 20-minute session with 10 minutes for questions. We're going to talk about how this study came together. Uh, a little background on the slow food movement and slow reading uh, techniques, um, a short review of literature, um, then we're going to discuss the methods and the assignment under investigation in our study, uh, uh, as well as results, discussion, and implications of our study, uh, and then we will cover some recommendations for slow reading implementation. So how this study came together, uh, basically, Cynthia and I met at a teaching conference. We met at the Sunshine State Teaching and Learning Conference in Florida. Uh, we were both presenting. We attended each other's presentations. Uh, and we found out that I teach a first-year literature course using food essays to inform style writing and cho uh, writing choices. Uh, and Cynthia teaches a lower-level culinary operations course using food essays to teach about healthy eating and food choices. Uh, and so when we discovered these similar interests, interests in uh, teaching and reading, uh, deep learning and contemplative pedagogy, uh, we decided to work together on a study. We, we actually sat next to each other at lunch uh, and sort of uh, brainstormed this idea. So this is where our study comes from. A little background uh, and literature on slow food. Uh, you might be familiar with the slow food movement. Uh, it comes from uh, Carlo Petrini, uh, an Italian who um, was advocating for uh, slow food methods beginning around the 1980s in Italy, kind of in response to industrialization, uh, McDonald's coming to Italy and things like that. Uh, but he was also drawing on a quote from uh, a French philosopher uh, and food writer, Briat Savarin, who said you should eat slowly and savor thoughtfully. Um, and basically the slow food movement is interested and still interested in gaining wisdom, um, sort of getting away from quick production uh, and having greater sensory awareness and higher quality of experience with food. Um, this relates uh, to the slow reading movement. Um, the origins of the slow reading movement go back pretty far. Uh, they go back to um, Christian monks uh, in the third century CE. And these monks use something called Lectio Divina. Uh, Mary Keeter has written about this. Uh, that typically involved selecting the text and sort of preparing it, listening to it being read, doing slow, deliberative reading, uh, and then a performative reading. So this sort of paced, uh, uh, repetitive reading to sort of ease in and build deeper relationships to a text. Um, this has been uh, implemented in contemporary settings. Uh, the benefits of slow reading uh, that have been attributed to this act are deeper emotional connections to texts. Um, uh, some folks have said that it uh, yields deeper meaning through intentionally paced engagement with the texts. Uh, others like Salvo have said that you're sort of co-located with the text, so you're kind of being with the work, um, uh, more attuned to what's in the text uh, because you're spending more time with it in this paced, engaged way. Uh, the word attunement is often used in the writing on slow um, 
slow reading techniques. Um, it is thought that it uh, improves student attention um, and there, it helps you develop a greater awareness of the text and perhaps other things like your values and uh, things like that. Um, Modern adaptations of slow reading take many forms, but they typically involve reading, pausing for introspection, rereading again, oftentimes aloud, and then having further rumination on a text and uh, writing a response. So we were very interested in these techniques, um, and we were trying to figure out a way to look at these techniques. Um, and so we kind of reached back into prior theory um, most importantly, we wanted to look at these techniques through the lens of significant learning. So this is, you know, D. Fink's uh, taxonomy for learning. Uh, and the reason why we chose significant learning is because uh, Fink allows for integration, so making connections to concepts, the human dimension, so learning about oneself, um, and the caring dimension, uh, having new feelings and values, and then learning how to learn. Uh, becoming self-directed as learners. Uh, a lot of these have significant overlap to the literature on slow reading, so we thought this would be a useful lens uh, through which to look at this uh, technique that we were going to share with our students. Uh, we also wanted to look through uh, the lens of deep learning. So deep learning comes from Martin and forgive me, I'm, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, I'm certainly going to mispronounce this, Salio. Um, this is a 1976 study uh, about undergraduate reading, so it's quite appropriate, um, that sort of started the conversation about deep learning and has been written about since in, in a variety of ways. But basically pointing out this deep con uh, learning concept points out that there's surface learning, sort of short range memorization outcomes, and then deep learning, which is a deeper engagement uh, with texts. Um, and we thought that this is exactly what we were going for with um, with our classes. So we wanted to achieve deep learning and sort of analyze what happens when we um, do slow reading uh, with our students. So the purpose of the study was to introduce slow reading techniques to undergraduate college students and investigate uh, the deep learning impacts of these techniques. Uh, also, the objectives of the study were to utilize grounded techniques to generate themes and map those onto prior theory, the prior theory being significant learning as well as deep learning. And now I'm going to hand it over to Cynthia. All right, so um, this was a qualitative uh, design, and I'll uh, talk a little bit more about the instructions and how we derived the data and, and how we analyzed it. But it, this was guided by um, good practice for SOTL research, um, followed by Felton, in which um, we had the, the principles were inquiry into student learning and our evidence was that we were promoting significant and deep learning. We were um, seeking to have the assignment be uh, critically reflective. Um, another principle is that a study has to be grounded in context. And so this study was based on a common slow reading food essay assignment, which I will describe in, in more detail. Another principle is that um, it must be methodologically sound. And so um, these the the food essays that we that we readily provided to students um, we uh, had guided questions for them to respond um, to to their experience. The data was blinded um, uh, and de-identified, and then we followed an inductive qualitative analysis based on best practices by Cresswell and Cresswell. Another principle is that. Um, it should be conducted in partnership with students. And so according to our IRB, uh, we had to provide alternative assignments so they would not feel pressured that they would have to do um, um, this work based on any kind of extra credit or special assignment. And then it was also voluntary um, in my course. Um, I'll talk about that in a moment um, as it was offered as extra credit. And then finally, um, uh, uh, good practice means that the study must be appropriately public. And so this is one of the ways we disseminate the information and then we also intend to have this published. Um, so that is um, the, the SOTL piece, but on the design, 
what we did was we utilized this common reading and writing assignment based in slow techniques. So here are the instructions. In both of our courses, and uh, when I, uh, in the next slide I'll talk a little bit about um, who the students were, but the basic assignment was that students were to read The Pleasures of Eating by Wendell Berry and Why McDonald's Fries Taste So Good by Eric Schlosser. And they had to read both of these essays all the way through without taking notes, just kind of, you know, digesting them. And then they were instructed to reflect on those essays and think about the main points of each. And then they were instructed to reread each essay out loud and prepare notes in the margins or on a separate piece of paper or, or digitally. Um, this was before COVID, so we um, allowed them to use Word docs and such. And then finally, they were asked to write a one to two page reflection paper in which we provided the same guided questions um, and students uh, wrote a little piece on that and then that was the data that was analyzed. Next slide, please. Uh, the data were collected in the fall of 2019 um, with 12 students participating. That was from uh, Brian's course. And then my course was in the spring of 2019 in which 16 students participated and it was a um, it was provided as an extra credit assignment. Brian's course was a literature-based course for first-year students, and my course was a uh, culinary operations um, uh, course in which we used food reading and writing as a basis for students to understand the techniques of food preparation and use in the restaurant industry. Uh, so this, that was the data that we collected, de-identified, and then we ran it through a qualitative analysis in which we assigned codes and generated themes, and uh, we used MaxQDA uh, uh, software for this. And in total, we generated 993 coded segments in which two overarching themes emerged with nine sub themes and they were easily distinguishable. We did this in an iterative fashion and, and worked for several months in triangulating the data, trying to get some meaning and we generated some maps. Um, next slide, please. And we can share here uh, just some frequency, a frequency table of the overarching themes and, and the meaning that we assign. We can see the two major themes were content and material. And the second theme, uh, overarching theme, was contemplation and reflection. So one of the questions, the guided questions that uh, the students were prompted, uh, they were to discuss the writing choices and the audience and who was this essay speaking to and why. And I think because of that question prompt, it elicited one of these major themes, which was their how they spoke about the content and the material itself. They were critical, favorably and unfavorably, on the stylistic writing choices, um, and then this sort of sub-critical, this um, sub-theme of critical was that some were able to easily identify what was what they perceived as good or bad about the writing choices, and then some, you know, made a best guess. Um, but th that was ov overall uh, the theme about the content and the material. The second overarching theme was related more towards uh, deep learning and um, that was this contemplation and reflection. And what we see here is uh, the, the sub-themes that, that when we triangulated, uh, we identified those as um, codes that were, or, or segments that had to do with a new awareness or enlightenment about food or tasting food or the way st students thought about food. Students also kind of gave broad generalizations. Uh, for example, you know, everyone should feel this way about fr McDonald's fries, and everyone usually thinks about it. It was kind of a transitional uh, theme on that generalization. 
Uh, in contrast to the new awareness and enlightenment, there was also a new awareness and disappointment sub theme where students kind of learned some new things about food from those essays and that made them a little disappointed and disheartened. There was also personal storytelling involved where students, you know, would, would mention, you know, my grandma had a, had a garden and I so enjoyed picking tomatoes and, and this, this essay made me think about those wonderful times and how I should really care about food. So there was this little narrative that some students um, engaged in. Their sub-theme also, uh, was also about connecting and linking to the real world. So there were some um, narratives where students would say, um, I learned in this essay that you know, um, it's better to eat some food that's grown perhaps and I intend to ha have a garden in the future. I intend to buy things from farmers markets, things like that. Also another sub thing was prior knowledge which was uh, kind of surprising. There was a lot, there's some, you know, several comments of I knew this before, I, I already know about this, this is not new to me, but I still do it anyway. Um, so, so that was part of it. And then coming to terms, was this kind of the final arc of the story, which was, you know, I, I, I know about this or I learned about this. It makes me feel this way about the food that I eat and the way that I think about eating and I'm going to have to change or I'm okay with eating like this. So there was like a coming to terms. Um, next slide, please. So through the use of the software, um, there's, a, there's a lot of um, really nice tools in that software which helps to create um, and, and show through, through the coding process the interrelationships, the frequency and proximity of codes to each other and codes throughout each of the documents and um, some, some really nice um, uh, features there that revealed uh, this pattern of relationships, which we were able to map out, and here we're just going to give you the highlights. But what what we sort of saw and, and and repeatedly was students came to their deep learning first of all through this content, you know, they that, and that was the instruction: read read the essays, tell us about you know the stylistic writing choices, etc. Who's the audience? And so they came to it with the content. But then the, the combinations and frequencies and relationships showed that from this content and from those slow reading techniques, they were able to uh, uh, connect to the real world, make some generalizations, tell some stories, and then that moved them into the deep learning. So there was kind of this stepwise uh, relationship here. You have two minutes, 52 seconds before. Okay, next slide. Okay, next slide, please. So super quick, um, uh, theoretical implications were that we feel that this, the, the, the way that this data came together and, and the interpretations of it based on uh, prior theory, we were able to demonstrate these connections through how, you know, coming to the work with the critical thinking, their awareness and connectedness, and how this technique can actually lead to uh, deep learning. Next, next slide, please. So some of the practical implications of this showed us that, you know, pace of instruction matters. It, it matters to intentionally slow down assignments, be deliberative in the, uh, be deliberate in the instructions, and also create assignments that encourage some emotional response so they can be internalized towards deep learning. Next slide, please. Some limitations is that this is a pilot, sort of a pilot study of sorts. Um, there were two different two groups of students from two different cohorts. Um, we we suggest some longitudinal work here. Uh, we suggest involving graduate students and non-traditional learners in future studies, and then testing across other generations and cultures. Off to you, Brian. So um, we have here some instructions for implementing slow reading techniques in classes. Um, asking students to read the text all the way through without taking notes. Uh, we've mentioned this before, reflecting, uh, reading out loud, and then writing a reflection. 
Uh, one important thing that uh, COVID has sort of pointed out is there are digital considerations uh, to these kinds of tasks. So students could certainly do this um, with Google Docs and cloud software. Um, they could use Microsoft Word uh, track changes. They could do word mapping software. There's programs like Coggle and things like that. Uh, voiceover and digital voice platforms. They could even use their own kind of emoji-based language if they want. So there's lots of ways that this can be done in uh, more digital environments compared to the environment that we did it in, you know, when we collected our data pre-COVID. Um, so that is the end of our slides there, but we now have 10 minutes for questions and we could talk about this further. Thank you so much, Brian and Cynthia. That was an absolutely wonderful and insightful presentation. Um, so we will go ahead and open it up for questions now. I'm going to give a long pause to see if anything shows up. Please feel free to unmute your microphones or go ahead and place something in the chat. I do want to point out to Brian and Cynthia that uh, Dr. Chick had commented and said she really wanted to come to your session today um, and she looks forward to viewing the recording later. So, um, and she thanks you for your work. In addition to that, I, I thank you so much for the instructions that you provided. Um, that's very helpful. I'm wondering, do you think there's a difference in the way students reflect if they prefer to write by hand or if they do things digitally. Did you notice any kind of difference in that? Well, I will say we didn't we didn't do it digitally uh, necessarily, so it's a little hard to tell. Um, you know, the, I'm just going to make a guess, which is that there's perhaps more intimacy in digital writing now for students. So it may help them make personal connections to the text. I think one of the key findings is that personal, personal connections to the text were uh, strengthened by the deep learning techniques uh, and perhaps it could be strengthened even more by doing these things digitally where students are sort of freer flowing in, the, in their text creation um, than in more traditional formats. What do you think, uh, Cynthia? Um, uh some, some one student uh, that I had hand wrote in the margins and took a picture and uploaded it to our, our uh, learning management system, and uh, so when running the data, I had to had to you know kind of redo it a little bit to make sure we captured it. Um, but I, I it, it might be a generational thing, you know. We have the the, the digital natives, uh, Gen Z certainly. Uh, Gen A coming up um, that like what Brian was saying it might be more intuitive for them to 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 be digital to, to do it all you know emojis or you know there's another software called voice thread uh, which makes them use um, uh, 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 voice or video uh, but they're, they're they're pretty savvy about that 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 actually could be a, a nice little experiment in a future study have have one group write by hand, one group uh, use digital means and see see how they get gain satisfaction from the course perhaps. Thank you. Um, it looks like we do have a question in the chat. It's from Elaine. Were there any challenges faced by students who have limited language proficiency when asked not to take any notes during the first reading? Hmm. Um. Do you have a response? I have a response, but I'm not sure if yeah. you do, Cynthia. No, go ahead, Ryan. Um, it's a little hard to say for certain because we de-identified um, the work, so we don't know who wrote what. Um, so, you know, that that may have uh, resulted in us losing this information. Anecdotally, I can say that in my class, um, there I, I believe there are a few um, second language learners in my class, but I, I never noticed a difference that semester in their performance at all in, in terms of difficulty. So, and none was expressed to me after this assignment. Um, so I don't know for sure, but um, no challenges were expressed to me. Um, and in other work, I didn't really notice a difference, um, but it's possible, certainly. Yeah, this is, that's a really important point. Thank you so much, Elaine, because 
you know, that would that would could potentially change um, how inviting this um, assignment could be. I mean, we certainly don't want to cause anyone any uh, you know nervousness or apprehension coming to the assignment. So. Um, that is very good information for Brian and I to take back and uh, incorporate into future work to make sure that you know it's a level playing field that people really want to do the assignment. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Hopefully others are going to start posting more in the chat and it looks like I think we just have one. Oh, Elaine says thank you. Um, please feel free to continue to post things in the chat and it seems like you've kind of started um, talking about some of these, but do you feel like there were any limitations when you were conducting the research? Yeah, there. Uh, so, um, what we didn't tell you about is Brian's a foodie, and I was an ex chef. So, <laughs> we came to this. Uh, that was when we sat next to each other at lunch. You know, we came to this because of our um, interest in food and food writing and that. And, um, you know, we, I use food reading and writing for one reason. He uses sort of similar articles, the same articles for another reason. And so, we kind of, this is kind of an exploratory study in that sense. And so, you know, one of the limitations, um, some that I mentioned but some that I didn't, would be to uh, incorporate earlier in the course and integrate it more in the course. I mean, mine was an extra credit reading assignment versus an, uh, a regular assignment because, um, you know, they, they didn't have a chance to learn the techniques in a different way prior to, to, to doing the assignment. So there was there's certainly some improvements that could be made. Um, Brian, uh, you know, what are your, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, we anticipated that the different um, sort of universities, different student populations would have been um, a limitation. And we were surprised when we looked at the data, there was no s significant difference in responses and quality of responses and nature of responses between our two populations. So we were surprised that we didn't have more differences, but um, certainly um, sort of I was, I had first year students, um, Cynthia students uh, may have been beyond that first year. Um, so that, you know, there was some key differences um, in the courses, but it didn't show up uh, as far as we saw in the data. Um, but there's, there's, you know, embedding it deeper and training the students more on um, uh, slow reading techniques um, could have had different results. Um, so we'd be curious in pursuing that. So I'm kind of curious to know, since you did this pre-COVID, are you planning to continue with this research during COVID and start doing things using technology? Or is this kind of, are you going to go in a different direction? <laughs> I think we're uncertain. We're, we're working. <laughs> we, we certainly could. Oh, go ahead, Cynthia. Yeah, I mean, I like the idea of looking at graduate students um, um, and and um, uh, you know um, um, fully online students. I mean, and expanding a little bit. I, I like the experimental approach uh, that we had mentioned before. Um, this was really a labor of love. This this uh, research um, uh, it was so enjoyable for me. I, I learned so very much, and it was really interesting. And we've we've chatted a little bit about future research, but we, you know, after COVID was you know kind of a big wrench in all of this, so we haven't haven't had this, you know certain conversations about it. But there there's a lot of opportunity I think to expand on the research. Yeah, yeah. After we finish writing this up, that's certainly possible. There's nothing that we did that doesn't translate. Like in, in some ways, my, my students um, back in fall of 2019 were submitting their assignments digitally already. Um, so, you know, it was more of a mixture, but a lot of them were submitting it digitally. So that it could easily be easily be done in more remote instruction environments. Um, there's really nothing about it that precludes that. Um, you know, I think we we were talking recently about maybe doing more scaffolding next time and, and broadening the population. Mm -hmm. 